so Marissa, I, I did want to start with you because because I uh, uh, and in some of the earlier drafts of the book, I don't mind sharing. Uh, some of my friends had to say you're you're leaning on her work too much, um, <laughs> and you know, as good as it may be, you know, you should expand the, the and I was saying but but it is so new and it is so good and it's yeah, so comprehensive and I've read it so closely and so recently yeah. to be fair you know yeah yeah so I so my one that's what like you, my my editor had to write me no more Baldwin quotes like, <laughs> I was like what like my whole book was like look James Baldwin said it better so I'm just gonna right 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 she's like say it in your own words I'm like what are you talking Okay, like what's my words versus James? Like, let me just quote him. So I, I well, that's how I take out. Yeah, no. So first of all, because my chapter was going to be the chapter on banking is so short, and I, I didn't. There's so much to say in 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 so little space, and it was either you and and Earl O'Fari with the myth of black capitalism that they kept saying, Jared, please refer, you know we know you've read other people's work. Maybe you want to let readers of this book know you've read other people's work instead of just saying, well, Earl and Marissa said, well, anyway. <laughs> there's so such, my there's, one is, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. There's such a dearth of, of, of text though. I mean, as you know, like having done this research, like I, I wrote the book because I was like, surely there's a library of books dealing with this issue. Of, of, of black banking, black economic power, surely, right? And I turned up with Afari and, and uh, Ab Abram Harris, you know, the 1936 uh, like pamphlet that is the last, and then there's like a, a smattering of articles, but mostly of the laudatory kind, right? Of mm -hmm. look at the, you know, and so there really just wasn't the literature and I am still actually confused as to why not. And so when I found your stuff, then like you were already talking about this, um, and I was really amazed someone sent me one of your YouTube videos after they heard about my project. They were like, this guy's doing this, right? And so I, I just, I don't understand actually why, you know, even someone like Andrew Brimmer, who you quote, um, you know, could have been like one of the reigning figures in this counter movement. And I, and I guess my question to you is like, why do you think that this other, um, you know, the myth, the myth has taken such hold, this idea of a black buying power, but also of um, get, gaining economic power as opposed to political. And I just wanna, while I'm talking, just talk about your last sentence here, which I thought was like such a powerful, is the meaning of power must be reclaimed and understood, not as resulting from consumption, but as organized, collective, and mass political action, right? Um, and, and obviously other people have said it, but. I just wonder why why is there not more uh, people talking about that? Well, you know, one of the I, I think one of the pro well one of the issues is of course that it's a critique of of capitalism and you know black or whatever prefix we want to give it. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately a critique of capitalism, and I think that that is always a problem uh, in this society in this country. But the other part that this is actually, and this is the hardest, you know, why I'm going to be talking uh, uh, with, with several others, including my, 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 my comrade uh, Todd Stephen Burroughs about the black press, because one of the problems that I think that we have to confront is that the, the commercial black press has played a, a tremendous role in promoting black capitalism, black entrepreneurialism, black banking, buy black. Um, in part to capture corporate advertising dollars. Uh, and so to convince those spending, I don't know, somewhere around $600 billion every year on advertising that some of that should go to black media, there was a sort of this, this uncomfortable relationship that, that developed between the black commercial press, the white commercial press, and the corporate and world in general to say, hey, we have people that can buy some of those products. If you spend money on us to advertise those products to them, they'll buy them. So I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, in conjunction with, you know, just an attack of political movements and social movements that would have promoted other critiques that, that you know, um, I think that's part of it uh, uh, as to why we don't see anybody raising these questions or even talking about, because of course I learned about Brimmer from YouTube. 
-hmm. So, so mm -hmm. even to learn about critics of black capitalism or black banking or buying power from the perspective of a quote unquote more mainstream, even quote unquote conservative critic, it's hard to hear. Uh, it's easy to dismiss the lunatics like me on the left and others, you know, so-called mm -hmm. radicals or whatever, but mm -hmm. even that argument, which I found fascinating learning from you in particular uh, uh, and, and Nathan as well, it's like, well, wow, how could, if, if they can't enter the conversation, I'm certainly not going to be able to. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, so I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's somewhat of, of what I'm, what I'm thinking is, is, has to be part of it at least, is that, uh, you know, the other part of it is, and Nathan, this is why, and I please, uh, you know, both of you respond to it, but Nathan, one of the reasons why I wanted you to be part of this conversation in particular is because the other part of it is, is the issue that you raised with us before, mm -hmm. that there's a pessimism associated with the critique mm -hmm. that people are uncomfortable with. Right. And I liked how right. you phrased it before that the real pessimism is in the, the you know, omission or the eradication of political efforts mm -hmm. or, to, or to engage the political uh, apparatus. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd love it if you could, would uh, respond to any of that and to, to Maris's initial question also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one of the things that, I mean, it's funny because I'm, I feel like I'm fighting this battle historiographically with my own students and with many of my colleagues um, to just ask them the question, you know, there is a very important literature that we have about the black radical tradition. And there's a very important way that we focused a lot on different forms of everyday and more organized modes of resistance. The irony is that what we don't have, and this is, speaks directly to Maris's question, is a way to properly understand why the more dominant strains of black politics are actually dominant right now, right? What are the institutions that have preserved a pro-capitalist politics? Why is it that black newspapers, you know, aren't just about creating a black counter discourse in a, in a public sphere, but they're small businesses. And so what are the values often associated with even small scale capitalist enterprise? When you look at the history of black business, black business has historically been an, an engine of anti-union sentiment because you can't organize workforces under under capitalized institutions like black businesses because they can't worry about collective bargaining, right? So you look at the history of black business and this is written in, you know, Chamber of Commerce records out of DC in the 40s through the 50s. There's all kinds of ways in which a very narrow form of acceptable conversations and approaches has basically to continue to take up space because we rely on black businesses and kind of the image makers and the, the, the people who are operating within formal government channels, the accepted, the leadership class, we rely on them to build and generate our institutions and our conversations. And so there is, I think, broadly understood a kind of acceptability to believe that, yeah, tell them to buy black, tell them to bank black, that's going to be the way that we got out of the problem of Jim Crow with black insurance companies, the problem of, you know, the, the, the lack of black business in the 1960s and 70s. We got those kinds of infusions and we just didn't go far enough. And, you know, I mean, one of the things I love about your work is you actually, you know, kind of highlight what, what I can only call a kind of capitalist historicity, right? To use a somewhat kind of heavy term, which is like the way that capitalists argue about the past. What, what has allowed us to get to this point, well, it's been a certain kind of bootstrappy, you know, thrifty, um, you know, approach to our small, medium, and, and large size goals and aspirations. And so, you know, the, the, I guess my point is the irony is, with all of the emphasis that we've basically placed on the history of Black political struggle, we actually don't have a way of explaining the rarity of Black political struggle. Right, we don't we don't have a literature that has given us you know another version of the Negro as capitalist you know or you know thinking about Black bourgeoisie by E. Franklin Frazier like there are these these works or you know the Crisis of the Negro Intellectual right there are all these kind of works that episodically kind of drop in that are like these lone dissenting voices in a broader conversation again Ofari is, is, is another one of these um, I mean it's, it's not a book that had a bunch of contemporaries that were kind of written alongside it. And so, you know, I think now about books like uh, Brenna Greer's Represented, 
Brenna Wynne Greer is a historian up at, at Wellesley, and she's writing about, you know, people like Bob Johnson, right? Ebony Magazine, like th these are not just, you know, places that are creating products or kind of these elaborate spreads of Black America. They're businesses, right? They're collaborating with businesses. They're, they're, they're confining and setting the parameters of how we pursue our citizenship. And, it, and it's very important, I think, to, to look at how, I mean, the history of Black freedom talk has always had, and, and I think you document this extraordinarily well, a kind of broad, across the political spectrum commitment to this idea that business and entrepreneurship and ownership is going to be our way out. Without, without setting any um, other part of the agenda saying, well, wait a minute, how exactly have capitalists been political powerhouses up to this point? What exactly has been the level and the scale of their power? Um, and, you know, just to put a final point on it, I mean, for you to, you to highlight in your work that, you know, you have the same number of black banks in, 2016, as you have in 1969, and this is obviously the, that, that Mercer, you know, has been been writing about as well. You know, it is um, I think as bracing a figure as any that this has not been working, and there there isn't a, a discernible kind of uptick. And that you know, the, the, even the, even the 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 one or two loan banks at the top have ten times the amount of capital as all of the minority banks, you know, put together. It's like yeah, there, there there's no there's no banking our way out of that kind of disparity. You know? I mean, that's why I kept saying, you know, um, to my friends, you know, I love your critique, but, you know, find me someone who, particularly as, as, as recent as, as you, Marissa, who has explained the problem with the banks. Mm -hmm. And then I thought of you just the other day, that at the risk of going too long here, and feel free to wave at me at any point, but, but, uh, cause I, I know I, but you know, a couple of weeks ago, I saw Bobby Rush defending Bloomberg oh. in an interview on Democracy Now, and he literally made that point, Nathan. And I and I thought of and I thought of all of us actually, and I because he said Bloomberg is best situated to save us because there's the same amount of black banks now as there were in 1969 or whatever. So Bloomberg was the re that was and that was in his defense of Bloomberg. Right. And I was saying, but no, Bloomberg is exactly the uh, reason why they don't yeah, work. This, <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, so, so, okay, two, two things. One is um, you should go watch, there's a Freedmen's Bank symposium at Treasury that happened like a month ago. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like nine hours, but just a few opening gambits are worth it. There's one uh, where Steve Mnuchin is being interviewed by some big, um, you know, I think African American finance expert uh, who I didn't, I wasn't familiar with, but he's just like lauding him about like, oh, we're so grateful and the Freedmen's Bank was such a great idea and all this stuff. And it's just, it's mind blowing, but it's depressing, right? Um, it's just this idea that, you know, every single speaker that is chosen, I mean, you and I and Nathan weren't, we weren't invited, right? To this big Freedmen's <laughs> Bank. Like it was all like, it was all, um, you know, black bankers, black, it's, you know, it's like tons of, it's lots of representation, but everyone with the same message, which is this is the way and this is the path. And it was really depressing. But what was heartbreaking is reading Carter Woodson's book that came right after the Great Depression as all the banks failed and all the banks, including black banks, but every bank, like the entire countries failed. And he is saying it was your fault to the black community for not keeping your money in the bank and you it was your like if you had just done this we would have survived this and he's just so mad and and it was that's heartbreaking right that's that is just um uh and it does feel but it does also feel like the idea of waiting for politics seems also to be uh just naive you know and this is where you know du bois mm -hmm. is like you know like waiting for a white god so du bois goes to black banking because he's just like there's no, like, we can wait all the day long for white society to do something for us, or you just kind of do it yourself. And so there is that sense, right? Like, I think the Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey tradition of Black ownership of stuff is just like, because they're never, they're never going to come along, right? And this is a majoritarian democracy. And you have anything that benefits a minority that is interpreted, it, and it always is interpreted as bad for the majority is never going to happen ever. And so in that system, 
there is a sense in which you, you, you look at yourself and you say, this is like an anti-colonial fight. And the way you do it is to gain sovereignty and control. And in that scenario where it's like, then just go all the way, right? You might as well gain sovereignty and control mm -hmm. as opposed to just going halfway and just trying to get banks because that, that's not going to do it. But maybe control of the school system and the, the fire department and the you know, actual like structures of power might be one path, but, but this is not that. Right. But Nathan, if you if you don't mind, let me just say one one thing, and then I I, I want to give you both the final word because I, I know I've I've already asked stretch you too much, but but I, I real quick I did re was reminded similar to your question about why we have this pr problem entering the conversation. Um, someone asked me, you know, you should go on Roland Martin's YouTube show, uh, you know, his his daily show because it's it's really popular and he's black and it would be perfect. And I noticed, and I, I knew there was going to be a problem, but I did look on his, and right on his front page, at the bottom of his front page, promoting his unfiltered, his daily show unfiltered, Roland Martin has uh, something to the point that, um, you know, and just as Nielsen points out, Black people have 1.3 trillion in spending power, and Roland Martin's show is one of a great example of the how to harness da 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 and I was saying, so I said, I was pointing out, like, this is one of the reasons why these conversations don't happen in these spaces, because there's such an adherence to and, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of symbiotic relationship with uh, promoting that myth in these spaces that prevents the critique from, from being there. So, so really, but I just, I want to give you both the last word. Uh, uh, Nathan, we can start with you, and then you can, you know, fold in any response you had previously. Um, because I wanted you both on because sort of, as I've said, um, I'm critiquing in, in this instance, the black banking claim and the tradition of black banking as a, as a, a collective advance. Uh, so I definitely wanted to ask you, Marissa, to, to comment on how you think I did with that or, or how anything about that. And Nathan, to you, I'm saying, uh, and we've somewhat addressed this, but I'm saying that the political movement side or the electoral politics or the public policy side of the discussion has almost been abandoned, uh, not without good reason, but that there is a relationship, there is a political economy, there is a relationship between politics and economics and power. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, sim sim simply put, what do you think of either my conclusions or my arguments there or, or or that argument broadly or generally speaking and specifically about your point about this being, you know, uh, seen as a, 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 a pessimistic space or looked at with pessimism, mm -hmm. uh, politics that is. Uh, and then anything else that you wanted to fold into any concluding comments? Uh, and again, thank you very much. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I latched on to about the argument that you end with is the way that propaganda counteracts different kinds of information to its contrary, right? That, that, that as much as, I mean, I, th I think about our particular mode of engaging each other and the, the belief that somehow, somehow all you have to do is present the facts, whether it be on social media or on MSNBC or what have you, and that the idea that somehow the, the person with the right information will carry the day. And I, I think you make a pretty persuasive point about there being a level of kind of symbolic um, affirmation of this narrow worldview, an institutional affirmation of a narrow worldview, where even if people are getting contrary information about you know, the number of black banks between one decade and the next, that's not enough to unmake the belief that buying black and banking black is going to get us out of this. And so it's a very bracing conclusion about us effectively having been conditioned by decades and now really over a century of propaganda to, to continue to believe in this particular approach. Um, what I find to be so fascinating about this conversation and the arrival of your book right now, and, and this is connected to, the, to the, the efforts that many Black folk have had to create these kind of modest visions of civil society outside of a kind of white mainstream, is in the wake of the crisis presented by COVID-19, we are left with very little doubt about the value of the public, right? We are looking 
to the government to solve any number of problems. And so much of what the banking black and buying black argument presumes is that we should concede the public as a site of political contestation and aspiration that seems to rely on these private institutions, whether they're DIY, you know, black owned institutions or the bank that's up the street that might not be necessarily black owned, right? That banking or some kind of entrepreneurial activity is gonna get us out of this. This crisis has made it very clear that that's not how it works at all. And in fact, it highlights the fact that maybe this is not how it's ever really worked, right? I mean, this, this is really the thing right now, right? Where you're realizing that, you know, it's not even enough to say that what we needed is a political solution. I think to go, just to make the point even more sharply, what we need is a reinvestment in the public as an arena. We need our public institutions. One of the things I'm feeling most acutely as a parent right now is the absence of the public school to which my, my, my kids go, right? And being expected to, you know, and Mercer and I, we talked about this in, in the preamble, being expected to run off copies of all the worksheets they need, to be able to have devices for them to all be able to go online, to make sure my internet signal is working properly, right? They all need separate spaces in the house with some kind of quiet so they can do their work, right? We are literally subsidizing our kids' education 100% right now in ways that have me remembering quite sharply how much I need public education and public schools. And if you go back to the point where black banks had their origin at the end, in, in, in the twilight of reconstruction, what happened in that case was again, this giving of a private solution to what was effectively a public problem. So reconstruction was there to create public schools in the South. That's where they create, that's where they emerge through the, through the experiment of reconstruction, right? It was about not just black folk being part of the political process, but them actually having the reins of the public sector. And that's, and that's where I think we need to really place our energies now. It's not enough to simply say, register to vote for another Democrat, right? It's to say, have a vision of the public that actually serves the needs of people and provides a kind of, you know, um, a buttress for community building, you know, personal autonomy, a kind of ideological diversity, God, God forbid, an anti-capitalist position because we keep getting into this, right? Like let political education include among its range of options, not just a pro-capitalist, but possibly a critical capitalist position, anti-capitalist position. I mean, again, I think your work highlights that, that, there, that there's, there's not just enough to say that people are given education, they're not given an anti-capitalist education. And, and that, and that is, not, is, not, is not an accident. So all, all I would say is I think, any, any solution going forward, particularly as refracted now through the current crisis we're a part of, needs to acknowledge how much we need the public and need to make the public responsive to the, the very you know, modest and everyday needs that folks have that they've been trying to you know, meet up to this point. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, what I, what I really appreciate about your book, and I guess it, that's why it led my, to my first question, is, is this idea of like the marketplace of ideas that you do so well and just tracing the modern, you know, the, you, the fact that you have Killer Mike in the same sentence as you have, you know, some, some conservative, right? Like this is, this is an idea that takes hold uh, and it lies deep and, and it, it is not only withstands time, uh, it withstands data, it goes across the political spectrum, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I love that you kind of stress that and, and your personal experiences and just trying to rebut this, you know, and, 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 you know, when I think about the marketplace of ideas, you know, you do think like there are, um, you know, like Booker T. Washington, I try to highlight, like, you know, he is the person that the industrialist chose uh, as a black leader. I mean, he was a gifted orator and all this stuff, but there isn't a marketplace, right? Um, but on the other hand, like, you know, I, like Martin Luther King is actually just like very effective and very, um, and he just understands the structural elements, but he's able to do so much good in that marketplace of ideas. And so I, I don't mean to be just purely negative because I do think the marketplace sometimes does choose the spokesman that it appeals to it. But I think MLK's is, is a spokesman that gets under the skin and, and forces it. Now, of course, MLK post-64 is not as effective as MLK pre-64, right? <laughs> but, but, but so it was a misunderstanding of MLK that gets more, you know, um, uh, you know, speed than anything else. But, 
um, I, you know, I think that that is something that I, um, I puzzle over just across the board. I mean, you, you look at right now at who are the black voices and, you know, or any sort of per person who's anti-capitalist. And, and there are moments where I think that message does have salience. And I think, you know, uh, uh, I think this may be one where, um, you know, people who have been saying, you know, to the Federal Reserve, hey, why don't you use your monetary policy powers to give people money? Uh, we were seen as extremist, you know, whatever, commies, whatever, and now the Federal Reserve is doing that under the guy. I mean, this is like under the guise of, you know, monetary policy stimulus, but, but you know, so I, I think um, there are like weak spots, and this is me putting on my optimistic hat talking. So I think your book is coming at a point where uh, I think a lot of people are saying like, maybe what we were upholding wasn't worth upholding. Um, I, I don't know, so I hope, I mean, watch that treasury uh, meeting with the Freedmans and then, you know, drink and then read your book. <laughs> 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 I think That's an important that, step, everybody listen. <laughs> <laughs> listen, I, I, b yeah. before the recording's off, I just wanna thank you both very much, not only for your work, uh, uh, past, current, and going forward. But, but I want to say publicly also, I appreciate the, the uh, willingness to engage, to critique, to support, to uh, grapple with, with, with my ideas, to let me uh, uh, grapple with yours. I really appreciate it for coming on and sharing some of this for this book launch. I, so thank you both very much for, for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. It's been um, super great to read.